So just a bit of context, I, am, uh, com I come from the Department of Internet Studies at Curtin University, but uh, am self-confessed theoretically promiscuous. So <laughs> I roam around quite a bit in, in the search of theories. Um, most of the work that I do is around uh, what um, some might call middling migration in the sense that these are uh, people who migrate not so much for social mobility, but for other purposes. Um, some of the work that I've done is on uh, uh, business migrants from China to Australia. Um, other projects include uh, the Malaysian diaspora research. Um, so 2017 actually, for me, marks 20 years in Australia since I moved from Singapore to, um, to Perth. And when Kat um, told me about this symposium, I thought, oh, man, maybe it's time to re-examine why I actually came to Australia. Um, so part of my impetus is because my observations um, over 20 years were that there were increasingly more and more Singaporeans coming to Perth, if not to, to Australia itself. And, um, and I thought, you know, may maybe I can do some research on this to find out if my observations are correct. Yeah, and if, if um, is it just I intuition or is it there's more to it? Is there data to it? Yeah. So, um, <laughs> two questions that I wanted to ask with this project. It is, by the way, a, um, a three month old project. So, I've just sort of put this together for this symposium. First question. What is it about Perth that draws Singaporeans beyond the off-sited virtues of proximity, wide open spaces, and relatively affordable real estate? And I say relative, that means relative to Singapore, yeah? And how do communication technologies in the form of platforms and apps such as Facebook and WhatsApp facilitate and shape the imagining of Perth as an alternative home? So, you know, like many people, the first thing I did was to look at some statistics. <laughs> so, bang, number one, correct. There are more Singaporeans coming to Perth or coming to Australia. And actually, if the, if the blue line says, <laughs> there are more coming to, to um, Western Australia. At the same time, um, statistics released by the Department of Statistics in Surprise, isn't it? Department of Statistics um, <laughs> from Singapore tells us that from year to year to year, the number of overseas Singaporeans, and they're defined as Singapore uh, citizens with a registered foreign address who are away for a, a cumulative period of at least six months in the past 12 months, um, the number of them that have gone overseas or us. Uh, um, is increasing. So in 2006, 10 years ago, it was 168,000. In 2016, this is in July, the stats are from July, uh, 213,400 people or, or Singaporeans. So proportionately speaking, um, the people that are, uh, sing are overseas Singaporeans are comprising more and more uh, um, a part of the citizen population. So more and more, in other words, uh, Singaporeans are leaving Singapore, um, albeit for a short period of time. Um, one of the most popular destinations of Singaporeans who do uh, go and live overseas is Australia. So according to the 2011 census, there were something like 48, something close to 50,000 Singaporeans okay, who, who um, live in Australia. Now, the census only looks at people who are born in, uh, born in Singapore and now living in Australia. So you will notice there's a line here that says Australian citizens and then not an Australian citizen. So the, the, the statistics don't you know, pay up um, exactly. <coughs> um, but, and I was again vindicated. Oh, no. Western Australia is where most of, uh, Singaporeans go to. Okay, 2011. Just by a little bit. Melbourne is actually the, the second place. Okay. And this is 2011 census. The 2016 census will tell us, um, I reckon, similar um, information. <clears throat> this map from the uh, SBS website tells us, um, this, are, this is a map of um, suburbs in Western Australia. And what, what it uh, indicates are the top three populations within each suburb. Um, I looked high and low for Singapore, 
And actually, there was only one place where there was a Singapore um, amongst the top three populations, and that was Garden Island. Okay, which is not on this map, all right? So what this tell, tells me is that it, you know, we're very sparsely distributed across Western Australia. So um, you, most of you, I think, will know that com um, just last month, Singapore and Australia signed a new partnership agreement and call it the Comprehensive Strategic Partnership. And much was said about this you know, enduring relationship between Australia and Singapore. And you know, um, even in the Straits Times, there was an um, a editorial opinion piece who said, oh, maybe Australia can be Singapore's economic hinterland, <laughs> which is an interesting way of, of looking at it. All right? Yeah, yeah. Well, so I thought, OK, how, how am I going to do this? So I, Recently, I've uh, started uh, looking at employing ethnographic um, methods. So I um, circulated an online survey, all right, and disseminated it amongst uh, many different types of groups of people. And then from the survey, I was able to recruit uh, a number of people and conducted semi-structured interviews with them. So the next few slides is just some information about the, the people that I interviewed. Um, Luckily for me, I managed to find um, participants that were sort of spread out across you know, age groups. And that's quite important, because we're talking here about social media. Yeah? Um, not surprisingly, because Singaporeans are you know, known to be usually very well qualified. Yeah? A lot of them, 60? No, 50% of them have at least a bachelor's degree. And this is also an important um, um, statistics, I suppose, um, because the year you arrive in Australia actually um, feeds into your reasons for wanting to come to Perth. All right. <clears throat> so one question, simple, yeah. What factors make you decide to leave Singapore? As you can see, as much of a much, and only uh, these two stand out. Yeah, out of forty-six answers, it, you know. So I said, OK, to leave Singapore, the lifestyle uh, for your own or for your children's education. Another question I asked was, what factors made you decide to move to Perth? I mean, why not Melbourne, right? <laughs> why Perth, right? So that, um, again, this came up um, as much the, the major answer. Um, but then, you, you know, you, these are fairly sort of instant and expected answers. Like, you know, a, it's quiet, there's a big house, big car, no traffic, less stressful work, less stressful life, easy education for the kids. Why not? You know, this is Pearl, one of my uh, in, uh, participants. But can we go a little bit deeper than that? You know, I, I conducted roughly about seven uh, interviews with people, um, most of it done in Singlish. OK? OK? Huh? <laughs> and um, from one hour to, to, to two hours, all right? And it was quite, quite intense, but it, they were very interesting conversations. So I gathered quite a lot of data, and I thought, oh, what am I going to do with this data? Like, I must find some theory to hang it on, all right? So I looked high, and I looked low, and I looked everywhere that I could look. <laughs> and I found surprise. Can you see this? <laughs> <laughs> this is what I wrote about in my first book. Social imaginary um, is defined as a loosely coordinated body of significations that enable our social acts and practices by making sense of them. So significations that make sense of social acts and practices. And it mostly consists of tacit background knowledge that individuals within a state society possess. Um, every society's social imaginary is unique to itself, and social imaginaries dis therefore distinguish societies from each other. So what is my argument? After sifting through um, the data and, and you know, in relation to my research question, my argument is this. It is the differences and the comparisons between the Singaporean and Australian social imaginary that draws Singaporeans to Perth. All right. Um, ten minutes already. Okay. <laughs> so, Singaporean social imaginary. There are two significations that are major. 
uh, you can talk to any Singaporean you know, on the street and they'll say, if, if you ask them, what are the two things you know, that, that characterize Singapore? They'll say, oh, meritocracy. And then they'll, maybe multiracialism. Lah. <laughs> That's what they will say. OK, so I'm going to concentrate on these two significations. There are, of course, others. Because in 1997, the uh, Singapore government tried to you know, build on to these uh, other significations. But I'll concentrate on meritocracy for first. So this is from, oh, meritocracy, just in case. Yeah, but I think most of you know. Huh? <laughs> but it's translated. This is from one of my uh, correspondents. And, she, and he said, well, if you're able and you work hard, sure, succeed what? You, know, you will be rewarded, all right? <laughs> So Kenneth, who is the manager um, at the uni, actually, said um, about meritocracy and what, how it affects the social practice of education. right? So he says, competition into schools, oh, getting ridiculous. My sister has to volunteer at her alumni in the hope that you'll get her child into that school. Why make it more difficult than it is? You know. So it's the, the signification of meritocracy that makes people think, you know, oh, in education, even you know, down to kindy, it must start with the best schools and et cetera. And then um, the other um, participants said, in Singapore, education is very important. If you lag and you don't catch up, then it's very hard for you. As you know, Singapore is all based on meritocracy. If you don't have a degree, you cannot find a good job. Your life is going to be very hard. Yeah, But meritocracy does not only affect education, how we think about education. It also affects livelihoods and how we look on livelihoods. So why do, not, why do we not have a culture in Singapore where they say, I am more interested in your outcomes, your deliverables, than whether you are here 9 to 5? It's designed as if you were an automaton, not a human being, and certainly not a human being with children. Now, this is um, from Kenneth, and he has very strong views about what it means to be a father. Okay? He wants to be a hands-on father. He kept on telling me that. All right? But you can, you can see that you know, the, mer the whole signification of meritocracy is so supreme in, you know, in terms of the social imaginary. So what of the Australian social imaginary? Now, just remember, these are all um, what people understand it to be, um, not exactly always factual, all right? Um, so Western and liberal and a welfare state. So if you start comparing this, you can understand why people are moving from Perth to Singapore. Uh, no, from Singapore to Perth. <laughs> right. <clears throat> so education in Australia. So this is from Pearl, who has two daughters. And she said, the kids love it. They tell us, the smartest things you have done is to move us here. If we do, didn't move here, I would have to engage tuition, tuition, tuition all the time so she can make it. She has two daughters who are now university graduates. So there's, there's a huge difference in terms of how they understand the educational or how they go about educational social practices because of that understanding of, I suppose, the non-presence of non a meritocracy. Yeah, and that this is Western and liberal um, society. <clears throat> and this is from Ben. And the, the interesting thing about Ben is that in Singapore, he was a very highly paid professional. But when he came over, he, he decided to sort of shift downwards. And he talks about his three sons. And two of them are non-graduates, and I have no issue with that, he says. They are not asking for, uh, they are not taking graduate uh, jobs. The other one works with aid organization. And whether he gets a degree or not, I don't measure his success by his qualification. And this is the important part, the last bit. In Singapore, I don't have a choice, right? So this again speaks to this, the, um, the strength or the, the pressure that comes from the social imaginary and what values it places, um, what, it, what it values. All right. Last bit. Kenneth talks about uh, putting the kids to bed every night. How he's able to, you know, be in charge of the um, the kids until nine o'clock. And this this constant comparison. He said, "I look at my brother-in-law, and you know, I think I'm so blessed because I, okay, I, I don't get to, you know, or he doesn't get to put his kids to to bed." <laughs> Thank you.
There's a lot of space to maneuver. You can change, you know, live your life however you want to, etc. Um, I'm just going to skip this bit because I think I'm running out of time. Five minutes, yeah. So he talks about, uh, Kenneth talks about um, Australia being a caring society. Uh, the moment we have someone near and dear to us, he talks about the pharmaceutical benefit scheme and how it subsidizes medication. And then he talks about, uh, you know, the consular uh, t taking care of uh, Australians who are stranded overseas, you know, whereas in Singapore they might charge them, you know, to their central provident fund. So does it mean that Australia is the utopia? <laughs> what do you reckon? I think that would be too straightforward, far too straightforward, because obviously, as I said, it's what people imagine and understand it to be. The reality is it's not as great as, you know, it, as they think it is. So I asked them, I said, oh, well, it was that great, huh? And Kelly, who is another participant, said to me, said, no, when I moved here, I had already worked for nine years in Singapore. But when I moved here, it was as if my work experience networks count for nothing. So there is a loss there. There is a loss there, substantial, for someone who has spent all that time you know, uh, in a higher education. And then Ben, who is a very conservative uh, Christian, and he said, this is a fully democratic society. So even though I'm against things like gay marriage, if the plebiscite supports it, I will support it. So there is compromise. It's not all, you know, hunky-dory, you know, you're in Australia now, it's an easy life, blah, blah. All right? So now, I was expecting when I asked my uh, respondents uh, on the survey, you know, what, what kind of social media do you use? I thought Facebook, bound to be Facebook. Eh, eh. <laughs> What's app? Now, this is down to the oldest participant who was 76, OK? And she said, I've used WhatsApp. All right, this is my main channel of communication. And that kind of surprised me because, um, as I said, I was expecting Facebook. And Facebook is only, you know, um, it's a second. All right? So just in case you don't know what WhatsApp is, <laughs> no. Um, so what, what kinds of things do they, you know, use WhatsApp for? Women's group, you know, uh, church groups, Makan group, you know, they talk about, uh, oh, what's a good place to have laksa? You know, let's go on Saturday, you know, <laughs> that kind of. Um, or high school uh, groups that people who have friends in uh, Singapore and then when they go visit Singapore, you know, they get together, etc. All right? So lots and lots of um, different topics and different circles. So in the end, I asked them, you know, tell me more about this WhatsApp thing. Why is it so, you know, so important? Because in the other work that I do on uh, business migrants from China, it is WeChat that, that features most prominently. Yeah? And my colleagues who do the Anglo um, <laughs> social media will tell you it's Facebook and Twitter that's most important. All right? So WhatsApp, why? And Ben said, oh, it's a very important uh, platform for me because it's real time and we get instant information. And this is exacerbated by the fact that he lives in the Perth Hills, which means he doesn't get TV reception. <laughs> All right? <laughs> so, um, and then Kelly says, what's that really changed uh, the way we communicate? You can, you know, where in the past you used to communicate one by one, now you can have a conversation with a lot of people. Yeah? So, back to my original question. One minute? Okay. Why Perth? Because of the things that we miss about Singapore, food and family, all the Fs are coming up. <laughs> because Perth is uh, conveniently close to Singapore, it's only a four and a half hour flight. And because it's the same time zone, I can Skype my mom, have my, my little uh, nephew or whoever talk to, talk to them. And this, these are not unexpected answers, yeah? What else? Now, my colleague Terence Lee has written about Perth as a creative suburb of Singapore. And then someone said, you know what? I went to Melbourne. It's crowded and expensive. I went to Brisbane. It's very humid. And I went to Sydney. It's very hectic and expensive. Like, um, it was a lot like Singapore, they said. And then one telling um, result or one telling answer was, it's a smaller Asian population. All right. What do we mean by that? I probably won't have a lot of time to go into it, but I have to say I think they, they're talking about the foreign talent. 
in Singapore, all right? And they actually went into it, all right? And there's, there's only, um, this is the other signification that I wanted to, to bring up. I don't have a lot of time to talk about it. But in Singapore, there's a great sensitivity around race, yeah? And it, we are constantly being told that you know, must be talking uh, very careful about a race, we mustn't offend each other, etc., etc. And in a strange kind of way, it's become very useful in their settlement in Australia, okay? Because they have been able to then uh, tailor their behavior, their reactions to the majority. Okay, I'll shut up now. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Susan. Um, while um, Joshua is walking around looking for a question, um, Susan, may I please ask you a question? Okay. Can you please talk a little bit more about multiracial sensibilities? <laughs> we arranged that. No, we didn't. <laughs> so um, I don't know if, if you've read, but in recent times there has been a lot of uh, controversy in Singapore over the number of migrants uh, that come from China and from India who, uh, to, in, in, to Singapore in order to, to live, in order to study. Um, the government used the term foreign talent, and that has become a somewhat sarcastic way of referring to um, these migrants. Um, there is controversy because there's resentment that uh, these foreign talent are coming in to take our jobs. Okay, and this, uh, this foreign talent are here making um, things more expensive or that this foreign talent don't know how to behave because, you know, they are not quite um, as, as, as educated, as cosmopolitan as, as um, Singaporeans are. Okay, so that's part of the multiracial sensibilities. But for a long time now, the government in Singapore always tells us that racial harmony is always on edge and that you must be very careful not to offend each other and the different races. So when I talk about the multiracial sensibilities in Singapore, we're talking about foreign talent. In Australia, we're talking about the ability to adapt. Ability to adapt from, can you not hear me? <laughs> oh, um, ability to, to adapt to being, uh, to changing from being a majority, when I'm talking mostly about Singaporean Chinese, to being a real minority here in Australia. All right? So that's what I meant. Is that okay? Thank you for that extended explanation. <laughs> Does anyone have another question? Um, over here. Yep. Hi, Susan, and thanks very much for your talk. I enjoyed it a lot. Um, I was kind of thinking back earlier to Brenda's um, keynote and the idea of temporalities, and we were also just talking about, you know, the idea of travelling not just being, you know, the, the convenience of being in the same time zone. I'm just wondering um, how, the, how the pace of life in Australia might be something that may or may not appeal to people who are from a kind of Asian global city. And from that, I kind of was thinking about um, whether you have any counter narratives or you have plan plans to seek out counter narratives of people, why not Perth? I mean, there are, you know, what might be the perspectives of some of the people who don't seek out Perth as, or, or attempt to migrate to Perth, but, you know, return to Singapore or move on to somewhere else? Okay. Um, I'll try and return to the mic so you can hear. Um, I have had actual, um, okay, regarding the pace of life, one of my participants actually said to me, you know, um, I'm working in a job where I only have to work at 70% uh, capacity, but I'm happy. Whereas in Singapore, I have to work very late, I have to work overtime, you know, and, and I, my children have to study extra hard in order to get into the right schools and right unis. So yes, you, you know, the pace of life is definitely um, one perception anyway. The reality might be, you know, completely different depending on where you land up. Yeah, um, and counter narratives at this moment, not really. Okay, um, a, a lot of the work that I've done is based in Perth by virtue of being on the other side of the continent. It's, it's quite difficult to come over here. But I know that there is a, like in the business migrant um, um, project, many of those from China come straight to Melbourne. That's where they, where they love to be. So in, in the sense that, you know, many people actually prefer the Eastern seaboard than they then they come into the West. Yeah? 
We still have a few more minutes. Um, so one or two questions. Okay. Oh, Susan's whispering it's okay. I think Susan would like a coffee. <laughs> <laughs> you can join her for a coffee. Uh. All right, I'm gonna steal the last question because I can. <laughs> um, can you please um, say a bit more about what I'm sorry, I'm going to geek out. Um, what theories and who you're reading that influenced your ideas about social imaginary? Ah, okay. So um, social imaginaries, the first time I was introduced to it was during my PhD. And my supervisor said to me, oh, here's something quite interesting by Charles Taylor, the Canadian um, political, um, political social theories. Okay, and I read his book there, Social Imaginaries, and I thought, well, this is very elegant and simple, and I, it, it explains a lot of, for me anyway, because I had been searching high and low. I looked at Bourdieu, I looked at Castells, I looked at Foucault very briefly, and <laughs> I looked at Deleuze and Guattari, and I couldn't find something that could satisfy the way I wanted to explain my research on new media in Malaysia for my PhD. But then if you've read uh, Charles Taylor's book, you'll know that it's this, this thick. All right, 1 cm. So it doesn't go into much detail. So the other theories that I looked at was uh, Cornelius Castoriadis. Yes. Yeah? <laughs> and, and he's all, you know, um, Freudian and psycho, you know. But I want to say, was it psycho? Psycho babble? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, psychotherapy. And he's actually got a Marxist, um, European, uh, very Greek background. And he explained it in quite somewhat mystical terms. He talked about magmas and overflowing, you know. <laughs> and, but it, it provided for me a more um, detailed understanding of what significations are. Yeah, so he, he, he defines it as a, a truly original uh, um, signification is something like the word on the understanding of galaxy or constellation is something that hasn't existed before and people talk about it and they give it a name. All right. Of course, truly original significations are very rare nowadays because everything builds upon everything. And so combine social theories, uh, political theories, uh, Charles Taylor's work and Castoriadis, more Marxist philosophy kind of work. And I decided to put them all together and say it's a loosely coordinated body of significations that enables social acts and practices by making sense of them. Now, I'm internet study, so most of the time people think, oh, data mining, Facebook, etc. But I'm really interested in what people, how people use social media rather than platforms, okay? And so everyday social practices became the emphasis for me. It also allowed me to explain my interest and understanding in non-uses, right? So in Malaysia, there are lots of people who are maybe older, maybe in the, in the rural areas who don't use the internet, but they remain nevertheless influenced by the internet. Yeah? But the news that comes from it, the information that comes from it, or even the knowledge that there is an internet there. But how do you explain that? So a broad framework like social imaginary was what I came up with. Thank you. Can I go now? Thank you. Yes, you can go. Now. I'm going to sit next to you at dinner. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, thank you so much for a wonderful discussion and for all of our wonderful and diverse speakers and their wonderful field work. Um, I don't want to eat any more into your coffee time, So, but can you please do me a personal favour? You have to come back at 4 o'clock on the dot because I've been the worst chair ever and Kat's not going to invite me to anything else again, so you must come back at 4 o'clock. Thank you. <laughs>